Welcome to everybody. Today we have a very unique shiu on Maimonides' curriculum for the study of the Torah. It's actually not Maimonides, it's a little source in the Gemara, which we quote in the Sidu, which is analyzed by Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam and others, which is developed by Rambam, Maimonides, and uh, modified by Rabbi Yosef Karo and Rab, Rab, uh, uh, Isolis, Rab so it's a very complex topic and it's based on an outstanding paper by Rabbi Professor Tversky, which is quoted, you have it in the sources. It's an outstanding development. I thought before Shavuot, when we uh, celebrate Matan Torah, the learning of the Torah, the revelation of Har Sinai, and we reflect on our own learning, on our own Torah world, it's a good opportunity to see how did Chazal in the Gemara, how did the sages of the Talmud, and how did uh, the later commentators, the really big uh, giants of the Torah, Rambam, Maimonides, Rabbi Yosef Karo, and Rabbi Isolus study that. It is a very challenging topic. I cannot promise I can make it very easy. I hope to make it interesting. And I learned this topic for many years and tried to prepare it in an, in an interesting way. There is much more to say than what I can do in one lecture. It will combine Lamdanut, classical yeshiva studies. It will combine manuscripts, which we have to be very, very accurate to, to analyze the text. I think it combines uh, history, the, the three different figures uh, that I'm going to present, their different world, their philosophy. And last not least, it will hopefully be thought provoking for our own way, how to learn and how to develop our, uh, how to develop our own learning. So um, I, will tr I will try to think, to show very interesting things if it's too complicated, I apologize. It is recorded and you have a very good reference to read it up. And the next two on the Ten Commandments comparing Shmot and Dvarim will be a totally different style, much easier. So if it's too much for today, I hope you will still enjoy and be stimulated by that. I'm going to present Maimonides, Rabbi Yosef Karo, and Rav Isolis, who, com who commented on the same source and at the end, I would like to leave it open to reflect a little bit on our own learning. Here is the uh, background that I actually prepared, started many years ago. No, where is that? Wrong page, sorry, wrong slide. That was this slide, sorry. So here, that is the outstanding paper by Rabbi Yitzhak Tvelsky the Tolman Rebbe in Boston. He was a professor in Harvard and was a Rebbe. It says it all, that a very special combination of Lamdanut, of uh, Jewish classical uh, learning on, on a very, very special academic level. Everything I read from him is gold. Most importantly, his major uh, work is Mavole Mishne Torah, from the English, the introduction to the code of Maimonides which was for me personally a huge, a big, a big book, a huge, uh, a huge opening to learn Rambam as, as an entity, as a philosophy, strongly recommended. And he wrote a special paper on this halacha that I'm going to present and called it, I apologize not having brought the English version. He says in the, it says in the Hebrew translation that this section would have been that could have been a silent revolution in the intellectual history of the Jewish people. And you will understand, hopefully, when we move forward, what that means. So the handout is very packed. I'm told not to bring two packed handouts. So look at the handout as it looks now. It looks okay. We have only five words. Limut Torah, learning of the Torah, according to the Bible, Mikra, Mishnah, to the Mishnah, and the Talmud. That's what I'm going to show. You will find these sources afterwards 
it translate. What does the Talmud say about the organization of my learning, of my curriculum? Where do I start? Torah, Parshat HaShavua, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. How much should I, how should I organize and structure my learning in order to grow in my, in this experience? Here we have first a source in the Gemara, which talks about it. And I will present it. I will translate to English only one of the, or one of these sources, they are very similar. There is actually a difference, but I will keep it short. And once we understand what the Gemara says, I will see how did Maimonides, how did he explain it in a very revolutionary way? Brilliant, revolutionary, meaningful way. Maimonides, as much as he was one of the biggest figures and giants in learning, including in Jewish philosophy, the guide of the perplexed, including in medicine, and including of integrating all of these features together, he was not accepted by all circles in Jewish history. Even some of his books were burnt. In, uh, at his lifetime and shortly afterwards, they were burnt because he engaged in Jewish philosophy. But of course, that was a short episode, and afterwards he was well respected. There was one huge scholar, and we will see what is the uniqueness of his chidush, of his innovation. One amazing scholar, Rabbi Yosef Karo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, who lived in afterwards at the end in Sfat, who wrote the, the, the Codex of Halacha, which is binding to these very days, with a lot of commentaries, he started, Rabbi Yosef Karo, to write a very, very detailed commentary on the Rambam, on Maimonides Mishneh Torah. And he wrote other uh, pieces on the um, explaining, um, a lot of explanations to the tool. It's a, I will not go in much detail. Each of them is a world in itself, which deserve not a lecture, they deserve a whole semester to learn about it. And at the end, we have a third scholar, which I would like to present, which is Ramoyshe Isselis, Krakow. He summarized the Ashkenazi tradition of the learning of, of these sources. So uh, that is a lot. I know it's uh, important to bring everything on one page. That is a big and very packed one pager. What I would like to do now is I would like to break it down to one source in the Gemara. We'll talk a few minutes about the Gemara. What's the basis in the Talmud? We go back to the fourth, fifth century in Babylon. Afterwards, we talk in more details. We talk in more depth about Maimonides' way to explain it. He actually did not explain the Gemara. He was reading the Gemara with his eyes and his mind in a very special way because his mind was Maimonides. So he saw very special things in the Gemara, which we might under have understood differently. And Shulchan Aruch, he modified him, not a lot. You see, without reading the text, that that's what I tried to do here graphically. It's very similar. Oh, something is missing here. That's probably the most interesting piece, what is missing. What does Rambam say here? And he does not say here. And Rav Moshe Isselis, he does another modification. He is a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. What did he add on? We will look at that later on. So let's start the journey. And if I say things which are not clear or not need more explanations, I ask you just to, to say words or send a message to Susan. So I try to elaborate it. I read the Hebrew and you have the translation here in English. Amar Rav Safra, Mishum Rav Shua ben Hanina, Mai dichtiv v'shinantam levanecha. Al tikra v'shinantam, ela v'shilashtam. Sorry, that's not translated, that is the source. You should learn, teach the Torah, v'shinantam levanecha. The Gemara has a very special drush. V'shinantam is called, as you should triple it, you should divide it in three pieces. Le'olam yeshalesh adam shnotav 
שליש במקרא, שליש במשנה, שליש בתלמוד. A person should always divide his years into three parts. One third to the Bible, a third to the Mishnah, and a third to the Talmud. So that's a very simple statement. I know what the Bible is. We can go to any library and see Bible. That's where the Bible stands, Tanakh. And so the Mishnah and Talmud. But the Gemara asks there, if I should divide my years according to these three units, I don't know whether I live till 120 or I live till 60, or I don't know how long. So the Gemara asks, how do you know how long you will live? So the Gemara says, the, it's not necessary for, one, for one's days. Every day or every week, if I divide every day in four hours, at the end of the year, at the end of my life, the accumulated, the, the accumulated time of my learning is that what I learned in my life, a third Mishnah, a third Bible, a third Mishnah, and a third Talmud. Interesting, very interesting, that Rashi says, Leyome yeme shavua, the days, because it says here, no, it's necessary for, one, for one's days. So it, the impression is that you, I divide the days, the, uh, Sunday to Friday, six days, two days, two days, two days. And that is what Tosfot says on Rashi. I will not explain it in detail. And I ask, so it's the impression is that Rashi was learning Sunday, Monday, Bible, Tuesday, Wednesday, Mishnah, and Thursday, Friday, Gemara. So that is what he explains. I asked Professor Avram Grossman, who is a great scholar of Rashi. He says Rashi is a commentator. He didn't say that as a psak. That's what you should do. You should be aware of the learning of these three fields, but not necessarily what he explained the days is not necessarily what he instructed to do. Halacha lemase. Tosfot says every day. That is what he says. And here we have a very interesting quote by Rabbeinu Tam, which I did not translate here uh, in detail. I should have done it. Perush, Sha'anu Somch, Rabbeinu Tam Perush, Sha'anu Somchim, Ahad Amrinan Besanhedrin, Bavel, Blula Bamikra Bamishna Uvagmara. The Gemarat Bavel, Balul Mikula. I translate. Rabbeinu Tam says, today, that we learn all day long only the Talmud is because the Babylonian Talmud is called Babylonian, according to one very, very sharp criticism in the Gemara. Why is it called Bafel, Babylonian? Because it is Balul, it's mixed. It's mixed all together. Blula Bamikra Bamishnau Uvagmara. When you learn the Gemara, the Gemara quotes. Bavli, a pasuk here from the Bible, a Mishnah from somewhere else, and other Gemarot. So since everything is mixed there, if we learn only the Gemara, that's actually fulfilling the instruction of the Talmud. We should divide our, our learning a third in, in Bible, Mishnah, and Talmud, because by learning only the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, says Rabbi Nutam, we actually learn everything. That's a very interesting explanation by Rabbeinu Tam. Extremely interesting. Uh, why does he do, why does he say that? I discussed it at length with Professor Rami Reiner, a great scholar who uh, wrote a phenomenal book on Rabbeinu Tam. And he says, it's not necessarily that he wanted to do it. He says, Perush Sha'anu Somchim. That's what we do. In the medieval age, it's obvious that the focus of the Jewish study was Talmud. And one did not study Sefer Yeshayahu as a unit a few days and Sefer Yirmiyahu. That was not the study. That is, in another period of time, people started to focus on Bible. They did not focus to learn the Mishnah at length. So the Gemara is very critical about the, about the Babylonian Talmud, that they mix everything together. To take this source to justify why we do that is a very, very poor uh, attitude. However, since everybody was learning the Gemara, they wanted to say we are just in keeping. 
with what we do because it has everything. It has Bible, Mishnah, and Talmud. And interesting that in the history, medieval age for sure, <coughs> the Jewish community survived because they have their own law, their own halacha, and they focused on Gemara, which, which gives them a very special uniqueness to survive in the diaspora with the Jewish law. Would they have learned the Bible, the Christian learned the Bible? It doesn't really guide on a halacha lemaaseh, on a very practical level, the Jewish life. So studying the Gemara is very practical to do it. But the Tosfot says something else, which I also fail to, fail to translate. Then Nirel Faresh, and he says in the Rav, Rav Amram Gaon, which is the time, time of the Gaonim after the Talmud, today we say in every day <coughs> in, our pray, in our prayer after the Birkot Torah, when we say the blessings, the benedictions on learning the Torah, which we spoke about last year, and the Shiur is online, on the benedictions of learning the Torah, we take one piece from the from the Bible, Birkat Kohanim, one piece from the Mishnah, Eilud Varim, and another third piece from the Gemara. That's just an example. So Tosfot says, if we do it in the morning and we set the three units, we got a little taste from each source, from the Bible, Mishnah, and Talmud, we are okay. That is the source in the Gemara. So we have to divide the days. Interesting enough that the later source in the Talmud says, and the later uh, uh, books, the later tractates, Smasechet Sofrim, he says, yes, you should learn Mikra, Mishnah, and Talmud, but it's the best to learn Talmud. But you cannot jump right away to the Talmud. So you better start with the Bible and the Mishnah, and at the end you come to the Talmud. Why? Because without the Bible and the Mishnah, you will never get to a good understanding of the Talmud, therefore you start there. So this source in Masechet Sofrim explains that the Mishnah, the Bible and the Mishnah is a good work to get started in order to get to the real learning, which is the Talmud. That's an interesting source, which I would like to leave like that for the beginning. And now we come to the Maimonides. Maimonides, and now you see the sources, which was before on one pager, uh, translated. It's based on Tversky's translation with some modifications. And he's very specific and practical. You will see how he takes the source of the Talmud. And he explains it, and he translates it to a practical daily uh, life with very interesting uh, explanation and expansion of it. The Chayav Meshalesh et Zman Lemidato. Shlish Batorah Shebichtav, Tish Shlish Batorah Shebaal Peh, Ve Shlish Yavin Veyaskil Acharit Davar Mereshito. Ve Yotzi Davar Midavar Veyedame Davar Ledavar, ויבין במידות שהתורה נדרשת בהם עד שידע האח הוא עיקר המידות והאח יוציא האסור והמותר וכיוצא בהם מדברים שלמד מפי השמועה ועניין זה הוא הנקרא גמרא. I translate. One is obliged to divide it in three, in three parts, uh, written law, oral law, and the third should, should be spent thinking and conceptualizing the end of the matter from its beginning. So the second part is not Mishnah, the six volumes of Rabbi Yudah Hanasi, who wrote the six books, the volumes of the Mishnah. Mishnah is the entire oral law, which includes both the Mishnah and includes other books, the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, Yerushalmi Talmud, Tosefta, everything that was written by the, in the rabbinical literature is Torah Shebaal Peh, the oral law. So what is Gemara? If Mishnah includes all the entire oral law, what is left for the Talmud? So he says the Talmud is something else. I have to spend time to think about it, to conceptualize it, to learn the end of a matter from its beginning, a deduction one thing from the other, comparing one to the other, starring the, her the hermeneutical principles by which the Torah is interpreted, until one knows the essence of these principles 
and how one can deduce from what is permitted and what is forbidden from what one has learned traditionally. That is what the Talmud does. So the Rambam says, I'm not learning the Talmud. I am the Talmud. The same way that the Talmud was very open-minded and everything was interesting to him, and they compared and they, and they discussed two, two Jews, two opinions, and they clarified it and elaborated. It's an ongoing discussion. This ongoing discussion is what happens in the Talmud. The Rambam says the Talmud was not finalized uh, 500 years after the, uh, in the fifth, sixth century. The Talmud is an ongoing process of learning. It's true, it was written down uh, in the fifth century, but I, if I keep talking about it and discussing like the Talmud, I am the Talmud. And interesting enough that the Gemara is called Gemara because I complete it, I, it's a never ending discussion. So if I discuss the Talmud and I reflect about it and I understand the principle, the concepts, and I can learn, please pay attention, and how one can deduce to take it out. I learn myself with my own skills and my mental power how to learn and how to deduce and how to understand the principles from what is uh, uh, and I can learn if I can learn myself I can come up with conclusions with ramifications which I learned as a result from my own study that is Talmud the Gemara the Babylonian Talmud is included in Torah Shebaal Peh not only is, is included in Mishnah, which is Torah Sheba'al Peh. That's an interesting innovation, an interesting fidush. Now he gets very practical. Ketzad, how do I do that? And here, please pay attention. Haya ba'al omanut v'haya osek b'mlachto, shalosh sha'ot b'yom, u'vatora teisha. If one is a, has a job, he works three hours a day. Very interesting. In Hilchot Talmud Torah, he's not talking about it that one should work and make his own living and not be dependent from others. He learns how to learn. He explains how to learn. But he does not skip this important clue. One has to work. If you work, if you divide your day of learning, first, you work three hours. He is very clear about it. It's a proportion of one to four. One, one three hours learning nine hours studying rambam he was a physician he was traveling from his letters we know that his biography his life was structured not all the all days like that but he is very clear about it first you work and afterwards he's left with nine hours three hours he learns the written law three hours the 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 oral law Three in the study of the oral law, and the remaining uveshalosh acherot mitbonen bedato lahavin davar mitavar. He learns the oral law. He learns the daf daf yomi. He learns masechtot. He learns halachot. And afterwards, he sits with a cup of coffee, and he thinks. He's a thinker. What does it mean? What's the message? What's the deeper insight of these halachot? which I just learned from the oral law. Mitbonen bedato is a unique statement. It's this very, it's a Maimonides statement. Mitbonen bedato. Lehitbonen means to get bina, to get wisdom. How do I get wisdom? It's a reflective act. Lehitbonen. I do reflections on myself where? In my mind. I have to use my brain power in order to learn. Whatever I learned, what does it mean? What does it bring to me? Where does it touch me? That's an incredible uh, way of understanding it. And now he goes further. Kabbalah Torah Torah 
even those things which are the tradition, Kabbalah, Kabbalah is not the uh, mystical world. It was not yet a, a full unity, a, a full field in, a, during his days. And it was certainly <coughs> not the field for Maimonides. And also those subjects called Pardes, which are the studies that delve into deeper spiritual essence, are also included in the Gemara. Now we come to a very, very interesting topic, which is presented in the Gemara in Chagiga, and we cannot elaborate it, that four, four, four sages of the Talmud entered the Pardes, Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Acher, Elisha Ben Abuya, and Rabbi Akiva. The Elisha Ben Abuya, he got heretic afterwards, and one was, one of them was successful, Rabbi Akiva. Uh, Heinrich Gretz, the big Jewish historian, who was a big Talmud Chacham, he studied with Rav Hirsch, and he wrote his doctorate thesis on Arba'an Nichnesul of Pardes. A lot is written about it, general philosophy. So the Pardes, which is philosophy, where Rav Elisha ben Abuya turned out to be, at the end, her 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 heretics, Kofil, that is included. We have to learn philosophy. We have to face philosophy, classical philosophy, Greek philosophy. We have to learn Pardes, whatever that means, could be dangerous. Four Talmidei Chachamim studied it. Only one got out without a spiritual damage, only Rabbi Akiva. But Rabbi Akiva was there. So Rambam takes the Pardes very serious as one discipline of learning. But one should one go to the Pardes, when he grows in wisdom, Rambam wants to grow, not in Torah, in wisdom. The Torah helps me to acquire wisdom. He wants to be not a Talmud, not a Ben Torah, he wants to be a Ben, ben a Chacham. He should dedicate special times to learn the oral law, the written law and the oral law, and afterwards, he has time, he should not forget it. And she, he, she would have time And he should spend the time to open his mind, knowing the written Torah, knowing the oral Torah, which includes Mishnah and Talmud and everything from the oral tradition. And now he should sit and think according to the breath which he has in his mind and the maturity of his intellect. One has to activate his intellect and the learning is part of that. In another place in Talmud Torah, he says that you should learn Pardes and he's very, very clear. He quotes the Gemara, four, four sages of the Talmud entered the, the Pardes Four of them entered, but only one actually got out there successfully, Rabbi Akiva, not the other three. So Rambam is very clear to approve the Pardes as a discipline of Jewish studies. You can imagine that there was a lot of contradiction to that, but let's first summarize Rambam. Rambam, a brilliant, brilliant mind, the most genius minds, I think, in Jewish history, who had that broad, broad horizon. Nothing was strange to his mind. He wrote in one of his letters, before he wrote the Halachot on Avodah Zarah, he learned everything he could read on idolatry, in his time, in order to understand Hilchot Avodazara. That's unbelievable. I don't know how he would have coped to deal with Google with all the flow of information we have these days, but no doubt, no doubt to my mind, Rambam would have found the solution. He integrated everything. Nothing was external to his Torah world. Have time to reflect and to expand and to think lehit bonen is very unique. 
That was his greatness. I want now to show you something unique. Heach yotzi ha'asur v'hamutav. How can he, can he deduce what he is permitted, what is permitted and what is forbidden? He has to learn it. And here it says clearly, you see here the manuscript, it's a manuscript which was once in the uh, Israel Museum. Huga misifrei ani Moshe ben Maimon, Rabbi Maimon. And you see here, he says very clearly, heach yotzi. That is, I do it, I deduce it. You will understand in a moment why it's so important. Uh, why it's so important. I wrote uh, 17 years ago in the Israel Medical Association uh, journal on Maimonides as a rabbi physician. And I want to share with you here only one slide and a few insights. It says in the Mishnah in Sotam, which he wrote uh, when he was 30 years old, that one of the sages there, Batluha Eshkolot, uh, one of the scholars, he was a illustrious scholars, they are called Eshkolot. Why Eshkolot? It's a cluster of, uh, of uh, you see here the Eshkolot, put them all together, that's a cluster of many fruits together. But he explains it differently, the Rambam. Va Eshkolot, kinuy al adam hakolel hamidot hanaalot vahamadaim lesugeh. Eshkolot is a person who includes everything. All the qualities and all the signs. And I use this explanation by Maimonides in his commentary to the Mishnah to explain who Maimonides was. He included everything. All the, also the Midot and all the moral virtues and all the fields of science. Mishnah, uh, Mikra, Mishnah, a very good understanding of the Bible. He quotes perfectly sources from the Bible very clearly and everything fit to a big picture, including external science, ex including the guide of the perplexed. And here I summarized his life, which is a whole lecture in his own. That's his life where he lived and he lived on the terrible condition, had to run away at the age of 13 to Fez and from Fez he had to run away to Palestine, to Yafo, Akko, he was there for half a year. He celebrated all his lifetime. The day they made Aliyah, they couldn't make a living there because the Crusaders were there. And he lived in Fostat and walked every day for one hour to Cahir to treat, to treat the king there <coughs> and went back and was learning. That was, that was him. These are the rabbinical writings. These are the philosophical writings. At the age of 17 was the first one, and afterwards the Guide of the Perplexed, and many, many scientific, medical, and other writings. He included everything. Everything was part of it. That is the brilliant mind of Maimonides, where everything is included. Now we come to a totally different scholar. A huge scholar, Rav Yosef Karo. He was born four years before the expansion from Spain in uh, 1492, and the family moved to Tzfat, and he had a brilliant academic intellectual capacity to study the Talmud, and he wrote, wrote a commentary on the tool, which are the four units of the, later on, the Shulchan Aruch, which he wrote, but he actually wrote a commentary on the tool called Beit Yosef. Yosef, because his first name was Yosef. And he took together all the sources from different pre earlier rabbis, big scholars, the giants of the Torah and the Poskim, namely Maimonides, Rosh, and Rif, Rif and Rosh, the big, big three Poskim. And he put them on his table, on his desk, in his study. And normally he decides what two of them at least agreed upon. And he came up with his halacha, a huge commentary on the tool. Based on that, he wrote afterwards what is ready to go, like a takeaway. How do you translate the takeaway to Hebrew? It is shulchan aruch. The table is ready. It's prepared. Shulchan aruch. Everything is there. You can just sit down and eat. That is the way he prepared the halacha. But before he wrote the Shulchan Aruch, which is the last uh, opus, the uh, work, he wrote a full commentary on the Maimani, on Maimonides Mishneh Torah. What a giant. 
and he explained what are the sources in the Talmud. Where did he take it from? Why did he choose like that? Why did he not decide differently? The, the Kesef Mishnah is an amazing commentary uh, on the Shulchan Aruch, where Rabbi Yosef Karo showed brilliant knowledge of Maimonides, of the sources of Maimonides. Maimonides himself wrote, he didn't have the time to write it up, all the sources. Rabbi Yosef Karo did the job for him. So his knowledge was amazing. He quotes now my Rambam, but he makes minor changes. And now it's like the game in the, that you have two pictures and find the difference. Let's read it again. You will see how similar it is, but please pay attention. On another slide, I will compare them. One is obligated to divide the time into three parts. 24 books of the Bible. Mishnah, he quotes the word Mishnah. Rambam doesn't do it like that. He calls it Torah Shebaal Peh. And he says, Torah Peh, Torah Gamhem. Everything is included in, Torah, in Mishnah. Shlish Talmud, but he goes back to the traditional explanation of what is Talmud. The Talmud is what you find in the book of the Talmud that they learn, discuss, uh, have um, conversations and have arguments and uh, like negotiations in the Talmudic sage, uh, 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 sages. But this way you learn to understand the basics. That is, till he understands what, until he know, one knows the essence of the mitzvot. Rambam says, what is the essence of the midot? The, what are the essence of these principles? Rambam was in the theory of the, of the Talmudic understanding, the Talmudic mind. Rav Yosef Karo is, he should understand the essence of the mitzvot. He is the posek, halacha. And at the end, he will understand what is and how that, that uh, which is forbidden and permitted and the like and derived from what one has learned traditionally. He is not doing it. He is just seeing how the Talmud did it. And here it comes to the same uh, text. We don't have to read it again. Ketzad, 12 hours, three hours you worked, three, 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 and, uh, and it's the same. And afterwards he said, he skips a whole unit. Where is the pardes? Gone. You study philosophy? Please. Can you hear what he says here? He skips it. He doesn't quote it. That you should learn uh, uh, other things. That you should uh, first you should grow in the Torah. One is not growing, as the Rambam says, He is growing in the Torah. You want to be a Ben Torah, a, a, a well, well educated scholar in Torah but not in Chochmah. Rambam wants to see a person who learns, he should be a, a wise person, full of wisdom. If he learns all the time, Torah Shebaal Peh, the Torah Shebichtav, you fix times, K'day Shelo Yishkach, and afterwards, V'yefane Kol Yamav Talmud Bilvad, and at the end, you keep learning the Talmud. You are not the Talmud. Where is the expression, Mit Bonen Betan Bedato, Let's compare now the two texts. The term, mit bonen bedato, I learn and I activate my own little brain. My brain power is engaged and activated and the active partner of it, that is missing here. You just learn what, it's, what it says in the Gemara. Ve'yefane kol yamav Gemara, according to the Rambam, Gemara is the ongoing learning that I do. After the time of the Talmud, I continue the tradition of the Talmud in my life with my brain. That is missing here. 
You learn the Talmud? Look at these two lines. Look what it has here. Zero. And here we have a most fascinating commentary of the Kesef Mishneh. That's the commentary <coughs> of Rabbi Yosef Karo on, uh, on the Rambam in Ilchot Talmud Torah. He says, listen to the words. Rambam katav masharatza. The Rambam wrote whatever he wanted. He would have done much better if he wouldn't have written that. Too bad he did so. Can you imagine Rabbi Yosef Karo, who is a, such a respectful student and commentator, a servant of the Rambam? We, have, we learned so much for the Rambam by learning the commentary of Kesef Mishta by Rabbi Yosef Karo. And here, all of a sudden, he says, Big Master Rambam, that's too much. Stop it with Pardes. He says it very clearly. Where the Rambam says Pardes is part of the study, in Ilchot Talmud Torah, he says, no way. But he doesn't say it very silently. And he doesn't say it, oh, the Rambam was a genius mind, and he did, but I can't. And we shouldn't do it. Rabbi Yosef Karo, the big admirer of the Rambam, says, Rambam katav mashakat, He would have done much better not to have included the Pardes. Four people were in the Pardes. Three failed, got heretics, were damaged mentally, spiritually, religiously. And you bring them to the Pardes? Are you crazy, Rambam? What are you doing? That's the way you want to educate the Jewish people that 75% should fail in philosophy? That's a dramatic argument between Rabbi Yosef Karo and Rambam. But look how respectfully, if he was very aggressive here in the commentary, and he was so respectful his whole life with the Rambam to write a huge commentary called Kesef Mishneh, when he writes his own Shulchan Aruch, he quotes him. He takes out mit bonen bedato and says, it's not that important what you think in your mind is good, is fine, where it touches your soul, how you feel about it, what do I think, what does it remind me, forget about that. He deletes these two words and he deletes the two lines of the pardes and he's in peace with the Rambam. Oh, Rambam spoke about kishigdal bechokma, when he gets better in his wisdom, because the Rambam was big in wisdom. The Rambam wrote a commentary on the Greek philosophy, Mishneh Torah. The whole Mishneh Torah is the learning that I can be like a king. The king has a Mishneh Torah, Dvarim 17. He writes himself a Mishneh Torah. I learned the Mishneh Torah, which is the big uh, <coughs> halachic work of Rambam. Everything gets a little king. He gets a wisdom, a philosopher king. The Rambam wants to educate people who have wisdom. Rabbi Yosef Karo says, no, no, no. Don't be that smart. Don't be a big philosopher. Don't be a chacham. And don't, don't be, as we say in Yiddish, just be big in Torah. That's what you have to do. So you can see, Ikara Midot, no, Ikara Mitzvot. You see here, find the difference. It's a beautiful exa example, demonstration, that Rabbi Yosef Karo respects him. Total respects him. But here he needed to do some modifications. Why? Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Karo was not into philosophy. The Jewish society he lived in, in Sfat. Please fasten driver seat belt. The, 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 the Jewish society in Sfat was not into Jewish philosophy. They did not believe that Jewish philosophy is part of Jewish studies. Just stick to the Gemara. Learn, tal learn Mikra, Mishnah, and Talmud. You know what the Talmud is? It starts with Masechet Brachot, and you learn to the end of Masechet Nida. At the end, you make a Siyum, and you learn the Talmud from the beginning. That's your field. That's where you work. That is the Yosef Karo, a very clear, a very fine modification of it, but extremely, extremely clear. Stick in your place of, the, of Jewish studies. Rambam, now we go back for a minute to the Rambam. He says, no, I know that the Pardes 
where Rabbi Elisha ben Abuya was, I know the Pardes is very dangerous. You can get the heretics. What does the Gemara say? The Gemara clearly says that Acher Rabbi Elisha ben Abuya harbe sifrei minim noshrim micheiko. He had under his table a lot of books from other authors of minim heretics. He was open-minded. He wanted to learn. You know the Bachurim and the Yeshiva, but in their bedroom, they learn philosophy because they wanted to open their minds. Acher, that's what he did. And he was not successful. He was a heretics at the end. The Rambam says, you go for it. Rabbi Yosef Karo says, never ever you go for it. You see here the amazing argument between them. Now here we, he, we have to understand Rabbi Yosef Karo, and I draw this, this little map, which is, sorry for not having translated it, but it actually shows medieval age, end of medieval age, in Ashkenaz, in Germany, France, Spain, and you see here, where did Rabbi Yosef Karo come from? He came from Spain, his parents, uh, they lived in uh, the escape to Tzfat, and he took the tradition from Ashkenaz, Hatur, Rambam, and, and Rif. He combined all these three worlds together, really three huge influences, which he put together. Why is he called Beit Yosef? So Tversky in another paper explains, because to, uh, Beit Yosef is, sorry, Beit Yosef, when Yosef brought his, his brothers home, in Egypt to his home, when they were in the exile, he brought them to his home, Beit Yosef. The Yosef Karo was named Yosef, but actually his rabbinic writing is like a homeland in the diaspora of Halacha and therefore called Beit Yosef. That's also an explanation by Tversky. Now we come to the next scholar. The next scholar is Reb Moshe Isolis. Reb Moshe Isolis, a brilliant student from Reb Sholem Shachne, uh, who was a student from the Byakov Polak, the beginning of the Polish uh, rabbinical uh, and world of Torah learning. He was a classical representative of the Ashkenazim. A very beautiful phrase, how he is defined. And he wrote his Mapa. Mapa is a tablecloth that you put on the table. What is the table? The table is the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan, everything is ready there. You just make it a little bit nicely, more nicely that you can enjoy as Ashkenaz, he made some modifications. What is he doing with the text? He doesn't rewrite the whole text. He writes a little commentary. And he says, there is an opinion that if you read only the Talmud Bavli, which is Balul, mixed from all together, you are Yotze. And that's a nice joke, which I forgot to say at the beginning. We people, classically Yeshivot, they learned only Talmud Bavli. If they heard once a pasuk from Sefer Yeshayahu and Tehilim, they said, oh, 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 I remember this pasuk. It's quoted in Masechet Brachot. It's quoted in Masechet Baba Batra. They know all these quotations from the Bible, from the Talmud. So once a guy from, uh, from these yeshivot came to his friend and says, you know what? I found a fascinating book in the bookstore outside the Beit Midrash. What's the book? It is a collection of all the quotations in the Talmud from, from other books just collected in one book. You know what the book was? It's the Bible. They never looked at that. That was the classical way. So Rima, he brings this classical learning, which he was so deeply involved and trained and educated, Reb Sholem Shachna, Reb Yaakov Polak, they learned only Gemara. Beautiful writings and Psakim. He brings that first, that you should know, a shlish, 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 you should remember, if you do only Gemara, you're okay. Now he says, One should learn only the written Torah, the Mishnah and the Talmud, and the commentators that go after them. 
only that. ובזה יקנה העולם הבא, אז זה בעולם הבא. אבל לא בלימוד שאר החוכמות. You do not learn other science, sciences. שאר החוכמות, other fields of wisdom. No external sciences. Forget about philosophy. You know how dangerous it is to learn philosophy? אחר, one of Elisha ben Abuya who entered the Pardes, he got burned out. No way you learn other chokhmot. Oh, you know what? There is an interesting psak in the responsa. You're allowed to learn medicine. That's okay because it, it doesn't bring you to, to heretical understanding, belief system. That chokhma is allowed. Nothing else. <laughs> No history books, no philosopher books, no literature. You learn Gemara. Oh, you can learn Mikra, Mishnah, Gemara. That's fine. And of course, Poskim. The Moshe Isolus was a Posek, so he, he includes here the Posek. And he quotes the Talmidei Rashba, who wrote very sharply about other science not to learn, but medicine is allowed. It takes us in much more detail. I have to keep it short. Now he says, Umikol makom yet. מותר ללמוד באקראי בשאר החוכמות. It is permitted to study other fields of wisdoms in an occasional matter. ובלבד שלא יהיו ספרי מיני, but not all the books you learn. Those who are heretical books, you don't touch them. No, you don't open them, you don't touch them. That by no means. וזהו הנקרא בין החכמים טיול בפרדס. You don't do that. פרדס are dangerous books. They would open your mind to study something else and you could fail, you could get burned. You don't do that, it's very clear. No, not that he doesn't. He says you, you do only Mikra Mishnah Talmud. You do not learn Sha'ara Chochmot. And he quotes the representative Drashba. And afterwards it says, but occasionally, you know what? You're allowed to do that. Uh, Rav Moshe Isolus, he wrote a response I called of Kat Rochel, And I found there two chuvot. where he says that he was learning in other books when all the other scholars went out for a walk. He was home and he, he used the time, there was a break in the Beit Midrash. At that time, he, he, he enjoyed to learn a little bit other books of science. Interesting enough, there is a tradition to say that Rav Moshe Isolis was a professor in the University of Krakow. That is what uh, Ashel Ziv wrote up in his research on uh, Rav Moshe Isolis. He was a professor, so not that much occasional, in an occasional matter, he had a good understanding of it. You're allowed to do that only if you really studied all the other field very, very well. So what is he doing? After Rabbi Yosef Karo deleted the Pardes from the Jewish curriculum from the Rambam, the Rambam had it very, very clearly as a focus of his learning, learn the Mishnah, the written law, the oral law, and learn everything, and afterwards reflect and build yourself and get bigger and bigger and broader and more wisdom. Wisdom is the, is the goal. Rabbi Moshe Isola says, Rabbi Yosef Karo says, no way, Pardes. He better wouldn't have written that. Rambam wrote whatever he wanted. What a terrible mistake of his big master. And now of Moshe Isolis, he brings the Rambam's pardes. He brings it back. You're not allowed to do that. Only become Mishnah and Talmud and Poskim and not Sha'ar Chochmot. But you know what? At the end, he comes with a little note and says, occasionally, if you really want, as long as it's not heretical books, You can do it, but not on a regular basis. Please make sure first you are a huge Talmud Chacham and nothing will happen to you. Let's compare Rabbi Yosef Karo to the Rambam. And you see here the difference. Mikra Mishnat Ugmara is a very classical way to understand Mikra Mishnah Ugmara with the Poskim. Sha'ara Chochmot, basically not, like Rabbi Yosef Karo. He pays all the respect of Moshe Karo, <laughs> Rabbi Moshe Isolis to Rabbi Yosef Karo, because he is preparing the tablecloth for the Shulchan Aruch. How, we, how do we do it, Ashkenazi? But he loves the University of Krakow. So if you really want to be a Chacham, you can learn it occasionally. And if you really want to go to the Pardes, look what Rabbi Yosef Karo says about the Pardes. No way, he says about it. No way. 
but he says you can go that as long as it's not really heretical stuff. Rambam had no problem with that. He did it full power. So you're allowed to do that, but Rabbi Yosef Karo did not agree to that at all. I just want to pay, uh, to, pay to draw your attention. Heach, Rambam says, Heach, Yotzi Ha'asur Vahamutar. I do it with my own brain power. Rabbi, uh, in one of the earliest prints I could find, a very early print at his lifetime, it says, Veheach Yotze Ha'asur Vahamutar. Yotze means that's what comes out from the text. It's evident from the text because the Talmud did it. The Talmud has here a source and here a source and from A comes out B. The Talmud did the job. Rambam says, I do it. Yotzi. That's not a mistake. It's not the typo. That is another philosophy. According to the Rambam, I can do that because I'm a mitbunen bedato. According to, to Rabbi Yosef Karo and uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Isolis, by no way you do it. And see, that's also an early print. Yotze ha'asu. The Rambam, it says Yotzi. Here is the tombstone, the Matziva of, Ram, of Rav Moshe Isolis. Hagaon Agadol Bedor, Maran Moshe Roe Even Israel. When he died, every line has a pasuk. And here it says, Umi Moshe ad Moshe lokam ke Moshe be Israel. What does that say? That is when you see if somebody is in Krakow and can take a better picture, please send it to me without these, um, without the uh, railings here. You see here, mi Moshe ad Moshe lokam ke Moshe. That is what was written about Maimonides. Lokam mi Moshe ad Moshe, lokam mi Moshe ke Moshe. That is what it says on, my, on Maimonides. His name was Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon. My, Moshe Rabbeinu and Moshe Maimon were the big, big stars in Jewish history. Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai and Rambam rewrote it. But now it comes to the Rav Moshe Isolis. His name was also Moshe. So he was a Maimonides in his time. I can tell you why. Because he brought back Maimonides philosophy occasionally through the back door when, every, when everybody else goes for a break, for a walk, he was learning the science and he wanted to be that included. So he got the title of Maimonides. What do we see here? And I want to summarize. We see here the source of the, of the Gemara, which is very interesting. We didn't uh, analyze all the, all the uh, analysis to that, but we got an understanding that one should divide in three units. That was not done in different way by Rashi and Tosfot. Rambam opened it like that. And everything that is interesting to his mind is Gemara. Why is part of the Gemara? Because the Gemara was interested to learn about animals, to learn about the stars and Kiddush Shachodesh. Everything was interesting to the Gemara. The same token, everything should be continued according to the Rambam and to, to follow your interests is Gemara. That includes Pardes. Oh, 75% risk to fail. Follow Rabbi Akiva, 25% chances to success, to, to succeed. He is fully determined. Pardes is part of it. Not at the beginning. Wait with philosophy till you have a good understanding of the whole Tanakh, of the whole Chas, of the whole Gemara, the way he understands. You are deeply, deeply um, familiar with the Gemara and the rabbinic tradition. Afterwards, you do that. If you remember the biographical, geographical chart of Rambam, he focused on Mishnah, afterwards on Halacha, and afterwards he, he wrote his More Nevuchim and his uh, medical writings. So he followed exactly this pattern. Ram, uh, Rabbi Yosef Karo, he quotes him with all the respect. He deletes here two lines. Pardes, no way. No esoteric studies, no strange philosophy. It's too dangerous. We know it from the Gemara. And afterwards, the Rema, who wants to respect, uh, who respects it very much, the Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch deleted it. No place from Lehit Bonen Bedato. That remains for Rambam only. The Pardes, Pardes was deleted. He brings the Pardes very quietly back. 
occasionally, if you did everything else and you were a good student, you can come back and do that. So that was a summary and allow me a two minutes of reflections for Shavuot. And that's, you can imagine how inspired I am by this analysis of Tversky, of Rambam's writing, Rabbi Yosef Karo and Rabbi Moshe Isolis. And I'm that a little nobody to learn from these big, big giants of Torah. Rambam stays still as a huge, huge model. What he incorporated, what he included in his writing, in his learning, in his teaching, in his outstanding leadership of the Jewish community, the community in Teiman, in, Yemen, in, uh, in terrible conditions of uh, conversion, he was a brilliant, brilliant leader. He wrote what he did. He did what he wrote. Not everybody is a, Ram, is a Ramba. Or let's be more clear, nobody is a Ramba. For him, Pardes is integral part of Jewish studies. We cannot walk away from our studies without the Pardes. Look at Rabbi Akiva, and he has very good, very, very good sources. Why Rabbi Akiva? was an example to open your mind for everything. Medicine, philosophy, astronomy. He has a book on mathematics, on logics, everything. It's Talmud. How does one recognize the, the greatness of God? When you look at his creation, you get right away, Miyad Yakir Ohevet Bo'o. Rambam was a huge mind. According to the Rambam, every Beit HaMidrash should have a, next to the Sefer Torah, to the Aron HaKodesh, should have a microscope to learn, I don't know what, biology. That is the Rambam. It was not Limudei Kodesh and Limudei Chol. It is Rambam's Torah, Rambam's Gemara. Not everybody could deal with that. But Yosef Karo, who lived at the time in the diaspora, so did Rambam. But Rabbi Yosef Karo, he wrote it for the for the diaspora communities, he want to be organized in the Bet Yosef, it should be a homeland. And so did Reb Moshe Isolis. He opened his mind a little bit in, in Krakow, and he was very close to the university, and it's a fascinating life that he wanted to bring the Rambam back, back, but he couldn't, not full power, but let him go in from the back door. Let's go back to the, a little bit philosophy as long not heretics. I do think that in our times, one has, of course, to follow the Rambam, but Moshe, uh, Rabbi Yosef Kavra and Rabbi Moshe Isolis to finish the Talmud, to finish uh, Mikra, Mishnah, Talmud, but to follow other interests, which are by far today the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the possibility to open our mind based on the Talmud to other fields is a really special challenge. When Rav Kook came to Eretz Yisrael uh, at the beginning <coughs> of the 20th centuries, he established his yeshiva, Yeshivat Merkaz Arav, and he wrote a little curriculum, what should be studied there. And it's a very, very interesting document. And he says, one should learn history. One should learn the biology of Eretz Yisrael, Tanakh. Our learning when we are back to Eretz Yisrael has new challenges. How do we learn about politics, about medical ethics, about uh, minorities? There is a lot we can learn. And we can deduce it from the Talmud. So there are new challenges that everybody should reflect and think how he wants to do that. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take easy questions. Thank you, uh, Rav Benny. Um, I'll say uh, some of the comments that we had on the, uh, on the chat. And then it's, I'd really like to open it up for people to I asked their own questions. Um, so uh, one was, um, I, I did answer in the chat, but I also thought to, to ask you and to hear your uh, answer. Um, Jennifer asked um, about the difference between the Talmud and for instance, those of us who study Dapyomi and the Mishnah. So um, what would you, uh, okay. you explain? So the Mishnah was written by Rabbi Yudha Nasi who lived in the second and the beginning of the third century in Eretz Yisrael. The Gemara says in Kiddush in Daf Ein that he was born when Rabbi Akiva was killed. Was killed as a, uh, <laughs> he, he died as a, a martyr. 
Murdered, yes. Murdered, yeah. So he started a new area when he wanted to organize the Jewish tradition, the oral law in the Mishnah. And these are the six volumes of the Mishnah, Masechet Brachot, the six volumes, uh, Zayim Moed Nashim, Nezikim Kodashim Tarot, which are huge uh, basic summaries of different fields of the Jewish law. These were afterwards uh, explained in the Talmud in Eretz Israel, the so-called Palestine uh, Talmud Yerushalmi, and the Talmud Bavli. And the Talmud Bavli, which was an ongoing discussion of the Mishnah sources by Rabbi Yudha Hanasi, these sources were discussed in Bavel and in Eretz Israel. We study today primarily during all the 2000 years almost the Babylonian Talmud for reasons which I cannot elaborate now, but the, the, the Mishnah, the Yerushalmi, the Talmud of Eretz Israel has very, very interesting new insights and talking about learning if, uh, I don't know if people are involved in, uh, in the boards of educational boards, high education of schools, to compare Yerushalmi and Bavli is a superb field of scholarship, which I never did when I was in my classical training. And I would love to see other fields of training and studies. We have the Mishnah and afterwards Bavli and Yerushalmi. And the Talmud the, is primarily the Bavli. The Halakha is based on both the Yerushalmi and Bavli. What's the difference? Not for now. We can discuss that another time. And the Halakha is an ongoing development. We have Halachot. It's a major analysis, there is nothing comparable in the history of, of cultures, that there is a source in the Mishnah, in the Bible, which is explained in the Mishnah, from the Mishnah, in the Talmud, and afterwards in the rabbinic literature, Gornim, and what we saw before, and is an ongoing discussion. Nobody can write today a halacha which is not based on the sources, a classical rabbinical responsa. So the responsa could make a continuum from Har Sinai through Mikra Mishnah Talmud and the responsa, and it flows. That's the way the term halacha is explained. Halacha is the, the, all the Jewish law because it goes, the Torah, holechet from Sinai to our very days. Is that answering the question a little bit? Yes, it's answering the question a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, that was excellent. Um, and now we have uh, a, a lovely comment from Gershon Hepner who said, an Eshkelot man is, is according to the Rambam, one who, uh, who lived before the Renaissance, a Renaissance man. So he really um, came before his time. Yes. So I really think that Rambam is the big Renaissance man. And he was a Renaissance man, not before he died. He was a Renaissance man. He says in his, at the end of the commentary, he says, I wrote the commentary on the Mishnah. I have it actually here. He says here in the line in the middle, when I was traveling based on the terrible events in my life, that we had to move from one place in the diaspora to another, from one end of heaven to the other. When I was on the, on the, on the, on the ship traveling, I wrote my commentary, I wrote the commentary. So he was 30 years old and he wrote this commentary on the Mishnah to say the person, where is it? Here it was before, sorry for making me dizzy. Isha Eshkolot, he says, Isha Hakolbo, he is by far defined according to his definition in the Perush Mishnah at the age of 30. He is indeed the Isha Eshkolot according to his own commentary at the age of 30. He did it in his life, absolutely. Yeah, very, very, very. You agree, Gershom? Gone. 
I don't know. Um, Audrey um, had a, a, a lovely um, insight that um, Rabbi Yosef Karo lived in Spad as, at the time of the Ariya Kadosh, who was a Kabbalist. So one would say that he was uh, went into Pardes, um, I think, if uh, we understand Pardes that way. What, what, do you, what do you think of that? So this time in Sfat was a fascinating time. This time in Sfat was a very, very small Jewish community. Very, very small. One thinks that according to what they wrote, there must have been 10 million people in Sfat. Not true. It was a tough time, economically tough, politically very difficult. There was a big earthquake during these days. It was a hard life. People escaped. Rabbi Yosef Karol escaped the family from Spain and there. And there were a lot of Kabbalistic thinkers. It was Rabbi Shlomo al Kabitz. I hope we can teach one uh, by Shlomo al Kabitz, where he talks about Kibbutz Galiot. It was a small group. And they had different influences. Rabbi Yosef Karol, who was related to the, to the Chachmei, he had a brother in law. Uh, who was part of the Kabbalah, he was strictly halacha oriented because that's what he wanted to make as a contribution. And he did a tremendous, <coughs> amazing contribution. They lived respectfully together and there were poetry, there was poetry and there were a lot of mysticism, Kabbalah, which started there. So there were place of a lot of other uh, approaches which were respectfully living together. The Yosef Karo liked that halacha, totally strict. And it gave the impression that he is chas shalom, narrow-minded, that he is against pardes. His contribution to the world, to the world of halacha is tremendous. I think that uh, if one searches a topic and we start in Beit Yosef, you just get everything on the halacha, and afterwards you can take it and search. But Beit Yosef is a basis like uh, till the very day. Today, we can use Beit Yosef. So he, he was, the, the pardes was too much for him because Kabbalah is the Jewish mysticism. But Rambam went to a totally different field, to Aristo. And there is a part by the Perush of the Gaon Mivilna on the Shulchan Aruch, where the Gaon Mivilna, who was a brilliant scholar, uh, 17th century, 18th century, and he said, So Rambam had a lot of criticism, including from Rabbi Yosef Karo, and also the Gaon Mivilna criticized him very sharply. But the Rambam was very clear about it. Once you studied it, you do it, he did it. That was his life. If you look at his life from the Rambam, that's exactly his life. Why did he waste his time as a medicine at the end? Because he wanted to study Chochmah and philosophy. So it was not by mistake that the Rambam lived so. I think it's interesting or it's important to, 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 to make the comment if we summarize the three big scholars at the end. Not everybody is the Rambam. Nobody is the Rambam. But that's the ideal, and everybody can make a little contribution to be a little humble. And, and not feel guilty, oh, I opened a philosophy book. You shouldn't feel guilty about it, because even Rav Moshe Isolis, who had the strong tradition from Rav Yosef Karo, strictly against it, tough against it, aggressively against his big master, even Rav Yosef, even Rav Moshe Isolis, he appreciated that the philosophy has prayed, has a place. Um, I think this discussion has so many outstanding ramifications for discussions about, this analysis has ramifications for a discussion about open-minded, Torah Mada, modern Orthodox. Rambam remains an outstanding star in Jewish history. Everything is included. Not only it's included, it is the very Talmud to discuss, to encounter, to learn, and to search. 
It's not you can bring it by mistake or by kvetch. You can bring it. You don't do that. You never learned Kamala. Very nice. Thank you so much. Um, I know oh, we're a bit over, but oh, I had to... Oh, hold on. Carol wants to say something. Yes, I wanted to. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, two things, actually. One is in response to what you were just saying. I thought I learned once that, even though we didn't publicize it, that Yosef Caro had an angel who spoke to him in visions or something at night. Like that he was, I thought he actually was he himself a Kabbalist, but it's not something that he chose, you know, to publicize to the world. And that kind of goes to my original question, which was, do you think they're writing for different audiences? Like it's so hard to believe that Rambam is writing, even though the Mishnah Torah is like a book of halacha, that he's actually addressing, you know, the usual the, the regular Jew. It's so it's so elitist with the, you know, like, I don't know. I'm wondering about the audiences. So that's a very interesting point. It's a very interesting point. It's obvious that the Rambam wrote his different writings to different audiences. And the, the, the guide for the perplexed, he wrote at the introduction very clearly who it is written for. Very, very clearly. And he had a student and he should not get confused and he will help him. So he had a very clear way of thinking and there were great scholars. One is Levingo, Yaakov Levingo, Professor Yaakov Levingo, Zichonoi Bracha, who, who showed contradictions in the Rambam between one book to the other. And he was very clear in his letters. That is a whole field that the Rambam knew to who he is talking to. Now, what you mentioned that the, these uh, angels in, uh, that Rabbi Yosef Kamo have, uh, these are a lot of uh, folklore, a lot of interesting explanations. I'm not sure if everything is really true. And the uh, Maharal had a famous golem, the golem from the Maharal. We didn't talk, include him, the golem in our learning today. He also spoke about systematic learning. But I want to be very clear that whether there was a golem or not is a big question. It's clear to me the Maharal had nothing to do with the golem in his writing, in his thinking, in his philosophy. He was also a mathematician, a scholar. Golem was not at all his cup of tea, not at all. But there was a lot, a lot of folklore who brought it and it makes it very uh, interesting and attractive to talk about the golem. The, the Maharal gets interesting. He would be very angry. I think Rabbi Yosef Karo would say the same. There is an excellent uh, book, I'm not sure if it is translated in, uh, to English by Joel Verblowski on the Rabbi Yosef Karo. He had a strict halachic mind, a brilliant halachic mind. So let's, let's forget all the stories. Or let's take all this story with a grain of uh, salt. Beautiful, thank you so much. Does anyone have a last question? Okay, uh, Asher Stein. Um, I, Dr. Betty, the, the term philosophy in the modern sense um, is not, it, the meaning that your listeners understand is not the meaning of the term as used by the Rambam. Today, we would use the term mostly natural sciences, not only natural sciences, but it's quite clear from what the Rambam writes in Hilchot Yisodei HaTorah, the second parak, the third parak, the fourth parak, that he's talking about the natural sciences. And in particular, in the last 150 years, after the Gaon of Vilna, the, there have been revolutions in the areas of the natural sciences, which I think would, uh, I think it would cause even the Gaoni Vilna to change his opinion. And the Rambam, if he were alive today, would completely rewrite uh, those sections of Hilchot Yisodei HaTorah. So I'm not sure what he would, I don't know what he would rewrite. But according to the Rambam, we are allowed, after having studied Mika Mishnah Talmud, Lehit Bonen Bedato. And that's a very interesting discussion. What is our study today? What should schools study? 
we have we live in a time of online education which is amazing amazing rabbi kelman does it amazingly what's part of the jewish curriculum and i do think that there is a lot <clears throat> to reflect about it what to include for sure whatever the rambam includes and he went very far the rambam is the big rambam who knew very well the bible the mishnah the oral law all included and put it in such a beautiful masterpiece in a harm, harm, harmonistic way all together. And he added all the other Jewish sciences in that. So I think it's good to reflect on the Rambam in order to do lehit bonen bedato, what we want to do in our days, but that is not for the discussion is a never ending one. I think we should continue in another, in another framework. Next week's, shiur, next week's shiur will be two short sources of the same text of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. I will not jump around in 100 sources. I will compare the two texts. I will talk a little bit about Naseve Nishma and the opposite. It will be very focused and very quiet and not jumping around. I can't promise one slide, but it will really be not that active uh, with all the fields, I hope I didn't confuse you too much today. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Benny. We really appreciated the shiur. It was wonderful. I want to just announce that tonight we there's a shiur uh, Eastern time at 8.30, a partial shiur with Shira Hecht from 9 to 9, and that tomorrow morning at 9.30, uh, Rabbi Jay is giving his class. So um, I hope people can make it. And uh, wishing everyone a happy Lagba Omer and a uh, Shabbat Shalom. Oh, thank you very much, Susan. Susan, thanks a lot. Pleasure. Susan, it's she is speaking at 8.30 or 9 o'clock? It's usually 8.30. 8.30. No, no, she's speaking at 8.30, but tomorrow in the morning at 9.30 oh. is uh, Rabbi Jay. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you a lot. I'm happy. It makes you happy. Happy. Yeah, it's happy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Don't worry about the long sources. There, we drink them in. So. Okay. I hope so. I hope you. Oh will not yeah. Regret. If you encourage me too much, you you might regret. Never. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well, everybody. <laughs>